So let's sit up nice and tall and close the eyes. Take a nice breath in and a nice breath out. And just experience yourself. Experience your presence. Experience a sense of being here now. And notice that there are fluctuations happening in the mind, thoughts coming and going. There are fluctuations happening in the physical body, sensations rising and falling away. But that behind those sensation, behind those thoughts, there is peace. There is a sense of stillness, openness. And so just take a few moments to investigate that. Notice the feeling that you experience the closer you come to it. The more you open to it. Perhaps even noticing if there is a gift there for you. And drawing the hands together in front of the heart. Together we'll lift our voices in one beautiful om. Take a nice breath in. Om. Sahana vavatu, sahana bunaktu. Sahaviryam karavavahai Tejas vinavadhi tamastu ma vidvishavahai Om shanti 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 Bowing the head to the heart, acknowledge self and all that is and draw the face to center, release the hands. So I thought that today we would talk about what it is to become lost in the calling. And what is the calling and what is it to become lost? And so typically when we talk about the word lost, we look at it kind of in a negative. I feel lost. I feel lost in my life. I feel like I have no direction. I feel like I have no connection. I feel like I'm unsure, uncertain, and unconfident. But that's when we're looking at this concept of lost in association with the material world. We feel that we don't have enough. We fear that we don't have enough. We fear that we're somehow missing out on something. But when we look at lost from um, the way that Rumi talks about it in, in his beautiful poem, Lost, to the, lost in the Calling, what we're saying is, I'm letting go of my ego. I'm becoming lost to that. It can't find me because I'm beyond that. There's nothing that I lack. There's nothing I am without. There's no story that can encompass the entirety of me or you or all of us together or of that divinity. And so we'll just become lost to those things. We won't spend time investing in them. We won't spend time misplacing our awareness in them. And so this perspective on, on the word lost means freedom. It means freedom. It means that I will open myself up to the experience of freedom. I will open myself up to the experience of being without bondage of being without limitation. I'll change my story. I will see my suffering for what it is and recognize that there's more to it than just misery. 
But what is the calling? You know, what is the calling? Aren't we called in this life to be activists? Aren't we called in this life to be spiritualists? Aren't we called in this life to be friends, to be family, to be lovers, to be enemies? Aren't we called by all types of things in this life? What does Rumi mean when he says, the calling? All you have to do is close your eyes. So let's do that again. Close the eyes. Take a breath in, a breath out. And notice that on the periphery of your experience, there are these thoughts, these ideas, these impressions, physical sensations. But what lies beyond that? What is calling to your heart from beyond? Just take a moment and listen to the calling inside of yourself. And then gently flutter the eyes open. It's almost instant. It's almost as soon as we close the eyes and surrender to a little bit of peacefulness. It's almost like a magnet that's there that suddenly draws us toward it. It's a light that begins to consume our fear, that begins to consume our doubt, begins to shine brighter with love. And that attracts us like a moth is attracted to a light, you know, at night. Only here, the only thing that is to be destroyed or um, left behind is the imbalanced ego. Because it is the imbalanced ego that stops us from moving closer to that light or into that calling. So the freedom is to let go of the things that aren't serving our freedom. That's the freedom. It's to let go of the things that are binding us into a deep level of suffering. So when we say, become lost in the calling, it's saying surrender to that. Stop holding back. Stop withdrawing into the material world and instead seek sanctuary in what lies beyond the noise. But that's difficult. It's difficult for us to picture. It's difficult for us to understand. It's difficult to explain. It's not difficult to experience unless, of course, there's a lot of distractions, in which case it's very difficult to experience because we might doubt ourselves. We might say, oh, that's not really what I'm feeling. I'm just relaxed. But what is relaxation? It's not laying back at the beach with a martini in the hand. You know, Relaxation is a sense of okayness through in and without and all around. Relaxation is being at a state of peacefulness. So surrendering into the calling, becoming lost in the calling, is to relax into a more natural state of peace without the need of the martini or any other substance. Without the need of belief, without the need of words, without the need of anything. It's just to relax into who you are, who you really are, into the bigger picture of things. So how do we recognize when it's the calling of the heart versus the calling of the ego? Because the ego is like Lyme's disease. It's the great mimicker. <laughs> So they call Lyme's disease the great mimicker because if you have a heart murmur, Lyme's disease will affect that. It will come across within that heart murmur. If you have um, poor vision, Lyme's disease will, will manifest itself within that poor vision and make it even poorer. Whatever you have, arthritis pain, Lyme's disease will manifest as that, as that arthritic pain and enhance it, make it even worse. So it is the great mimicker. The ego is the great mimicker too. It will manifest itself in your spirituality 
and turn your spirituality into a separatist regime. Your ego, imbalanced, out of balance, will manifest itself through what we perceive as love and apply conditions. The ego will manifest itself through what we might think of as a state of freedom, but instead of it being actual freedom, it will be the annihilation of others' freedom. It'll use itself as an excuse, and it'll use the calling as an excuse to become tyrannical, demanding, limiting. So how do we know the difference? The key is in the peacefulness that we feel. See, the ego doesn't have time for what lies beyond. The ego is too busy manipulating when it's not balanced. So for you to even take the moment to close the eyes, a war is happening. First of all, the ego doesn't want to close the eyes. There's too much stimulation out here. So then you say, well, I'm going to close the eyes. And then the ego gets very loud in the back of the mind. You know, it starts coming to the front and saying, what you see isn't real, what you feel isn't real. Just come with me into the stimulation again. Be with me in this outside world. Open your eyes, open your eyes. You can't do this. You're too distracted. You know how when you sit in meditation and we say to ourselves sometimes, oh my gosh, my mind is going crazy, I can't meditate? Well, that's what happens in this moment that we close the eyes and for many people there's this experience of, I can't experience this peace, I have too much to do. <laughs> that's just the ego playing games with you. It's like, you know, it's like baiting you, baiting you. But typically when we, when we are willing to overwrite the ego and go into that space behind the thoughts, behind the perceptions, behind the stories, what we do find there is a peacefulness which is something that the ego cannot produce. It's a sense of unity that the ego can't produce. It's a sense of equanimity, of love, of honor, that the ego can't produce. The ego will put attachments on those things. It'll say, yeah, I honor you, as long as you're like me, as long as you don't go against what I say, as long as you're not too out there. Yeah, sure, we're one. Just vote the same as I do, okay? <laughs> you know? Yeah, I like you. We're good. You know? As long as. So the ego puts the as long as on there. It puts the, the attachment on there. The condition. But when we lose ourselves into the calling... There's no attachments. There's no requirement. There's no condition. It's just there. And we know it's just there because every time we close our eyes, there it is, unconditionally. It doesn't matter how much in your mind you're saying, oh my God, I can't do this. I'm so distracted. I don't have enough skill. I'm not a good meditator. I don't like sitting still. I hate being told what to do. Um, you know... <laughs> We had the most beautiful student in one of our recent YTTs. Oh, she hated being told what to do. Just could not stand it. She had such, an, such a, uh, uh, an anti-authoritarian, you know, anti-establishment, anti, anti. Um, and she struggled and she worked so, so diligently to surrender. And, and I think... I think by the, by the end of the program, <clears throat> she was able to recognize her own folly, you know, of the ego. That this is all the ego's banter, trying to make itself self-important. Trying to make itself the be-all, end-all. And to obliterate any knowledge of the peacefulness that automatically exists within us. And that to be to be offered the opportunity to sit within the realm of that peacefulness is not a form of authoritarianism. It's you. It's you coming to know yourself. It's you no longer being afraid. 
It's you no longer having doubt of your own self-worth, of your own ability, of your own empowerment. It's not because some teacher sitting at the front of the class telling you to do it. It's because you're answering the call that's coming from within yourself. And what you find when you go there is something that the ego cannot duplicate. It cannot replicate. It's the only thing it can't replicate. And so, or, or manipulate. And so, the ego gets way out of whack. It becomes irate and starts causing anger and vengeance and telling stories about manipulation and this, that, and the other thing. And why are you sitting here doing nothing? You could be doing everything else that you really want to do. You could be at the beach. You could be on vacation. You could be at the bar. You could be out dancing. You could be reading a book. You could be drinking a martini. You could be doing all these things that you really want to do. So what are you sitting here for with this silly woman in white? (laughs) Having a fly on my hand. (laughs) And letting her stay there. She's Happy. peaceful. Be She's just she like, yeah, never. absolutely. It's just peaceful. She's like, oh, that's cool. Look, I blend in with your nail polish. <laughs> yeah, so the ego will try to keep us from that. But, but the thing is that the peace is still there. No matter how loud the ego gets, the peace is still there. Just waiting. Just waiting for us to make a choice. And no matter what choice we make, it's still there. We're either turning toward it or away from it. We're either diving into it or avoiding it. We're either surrendering or we are engaged in battle. Battle of the will. The ego's will versus the ego's will versus the ego's will. Peace doesn't have a will. It just is. Isn't that an interesting thought? Peace doesn't have a will. It's not saying to you, come here. (sighs) No. It's just there. And that's truth. So, So in the spirituality, what is truth? Truth is that, the ultimate truth, is that which never changes. It doesn't change. And peace doesn't change. Whenever you close your eyes, there it is. Whenever you soften your breath, there it is. It's just waiting for you. It's just like two arms opened and saying, I'm, I'm here, whatever, whatever, whenever. But the ego is always changing. The ego is nothing but a stream of excuses. The, the imbalanced ego, of course. You know, the imbalanced ego is a stream of excuses, a stream of, of insanities, a stream of angers, a stream of emotions, a stream of attention getters. It's like watching a great drama. Have any of you seen A Star Is Born yet? Oh, go see it if you if you. It's very good. Not only is it well acted, so well acted, and the music, of course, is just phenomenal. But the storyline is so real, so utterly real, pulled in so many different directions. You know just like we are on a day-to-day basis by our egos. And you see in the film very clearly where the ego comes into play. But there's also something consistent throughout the film. There's something very consistent throughout the film. Something that's not so much the ego. And that's all I want to say. And so now you have to go see it. (laughs) It's very good. What's it called again? A Star is Born. Yeah, so in the, what, the 1970s, I guess it was, Barbara Streisand and Chris Christopherson starred in a movie called The Star is Born. This is the fourth remake of Is it the fourth? Yeah. It's not really a remake, though. It is very similar. Yeah, but they're saying that it's actually not a remake, Um, which I'm not sure how, uh, because it's so very similar as to be really familiar. But I guess some of the details are different, and um, maybe the backstory is a little different. I'm not sure. But I'm, you know. So whatever you call it, it's a very good film. 
it's a very good film. I was thinking it would be fun to do kind of a, a marathon and watch all of them back to back and see why it's not a remake. But would it be similar to you hear people say that history doesn't repeat itself; it just rhymes. Yeah. So maybe there are some elements that are a little different in each of the representations. But absolutely, absolutely. And and Lady Gaga's part in this is definitely modern. You know, she's more modern in 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 being born a star. Um, she starts off a little differently, but then it becomes definitely modernized. So maybe that's why <coughs> it's not a true remake because it doesn't stick to the original script. Yeah, but um, but back to the there's this there's a consistency that runs through the film, which if you can see through the drama of it, you, just, you see that there's something there. And it's very similar to when we close our eyes, what's waiting for us. And what's waiting for us is peace. And we can call that peace love, too. We can say love is waiting for us. Contentment is waiting for us. Patanjali, in his yoga sutras, one of his sutras states that Contentment is the path to supreme happiness. Contentment is the path to supreme awakening. Contentment is the path to unity. To be content. Because anything other than contentment is suffering. Anything other than contentment. So what does that mean? Does that mean that we should never be discontent with anything ever again? No. That's not what it means. It means, is your discontent causing more harm? Or is it bringing you clarity? Clarity about how to conduct your life, how to live by your standards, how to conduct your own virtue, how to embrace your own inner peace. Does that make sense? Yeah. So we can feel discontent and it can throw us into a rage. You know? We can start calling people names. We can uh, start throwing judgments all over the place. We can start committing harm by, by uh, basically annihilating people um, you know, with our words. Absolutely. It happens all the time. Or we can look into the world and we can recognize what's actually happening. We can look into the world, we can look into our society, we can look into our community, and we can recognize that people are not lost in the calling, they are lost to the calling right now. They're not even hearing it a lot of the time because the ego is so, so out of balance right now. So what is the answer to that? Is it to scream louder? Is it to become more of the disruptive noise that's going on out there? That's where the contentment comes in. The contentment is to be able to look at the world and recognize that people are lost in the first way so much right now. Most people are lost feeling disconnected, feeling not unified, fearful, doubtful, full and full and full of stories full of stories that don't really have a base in, in even the material reality it doesn't have a base they're just coming up with things right and left that are just breeding more fear should we contribute to that no of course not the contentment empowers us to see that to recognize it for what it is and then to make the choice to be the peace walking through the world to become lost in the other way in the other direction, to become lost to the calling of goodness, to become lost to the calling of peace, to become lost in the calling of love, that we become the love. The ego becomes less and less present, and we become more and more subsumed into the natural state of love the natural state of unity. So we can walk out into the world right now and we can set off bombs and we can call people names and we can 
punch people and kick people and insult people? What's it going to do? It's not going to do anything. It's not going to cure anything. It's going to contribute to the fire. So if you really want to be a radical, spiritual activist, if you really want to be radical, you have to be the opposite of what is happening in the world. The opposite. You have to hold on to love. Be the love. Be the faith. Be the peace. Be the voice that unifies. Be the voice that says, it doesn't matter who you voted for in the past. What matters is that we come together now. It doesn't matter who you thought you were yesterday or even five minutes ago. What matters is that we come together now. Because the future holds no promise whatsoever if we don't. People are afraid of things today that that actually are, are, I don't want to say they're not real, but they're not immediate. They're afraid of the possibility of something. And that fear is running amok to the point where they're freezing. People are freezing in place. They're saying, I'm scared and I can't do anything. But they can. They can absolutely do something. They can come together for peace, for love and for unity. And they can say you're a snowflake all they want. People can call you whatever name they want. Somebody called me a snowflake once. Oh, Jesus. I said, thank you. What was that? What, how did that come up? Yeah, because I'm a liberal. What's that? Because I'm a liberal. I'm totally, I'm, I'm very much a liberal, right. uh, you know, in my own views of things. And, and I had commented on something. Um, and it wasn't a political comment either. It was a, it was a, let's all just kind of wake up here, you know. Let's look at what's being said here. Because what's being said, in, you know, in this particular chain of comments was, was really hurtful on, on all Facebook parts. Yeah, it was on person. Facebook. <laughs> I was on, oh, I've been called that in person too. But this, is, this particular one was on Facebook. And so, so this person who I don't even know... Um, it's not even a friend, it was just somebody on the feed turned around and said, you know, something to the effect of, you know, you're, you're nothing but another one of those snowflakes. And he said it with a little more explicatives in there. <laughs> <laughs> and I just said, thank you. And he came back, because this is what angry people do. He came back and he said, it wasn't a compliment. <laughs> And I went back and I said, but actually it was. Because while you may think that a snowflake is a fragile little thing, a snowflake is actually an intricate design of a crystalline nature that is unique in its own self. And when it comes together, With other snowflakes, it creates avalanches. Mm -hmm. It keeps you warm in the coldest of weather. It produces clean water for you to drink. It builds shelters. I mean, thank you. I don't think he ever called another liberal a snowflake after that. (laughs) But it wasn't meant to diss him. It was meant to educate. It's like, do you know what you're saying? Do you have any idea of what the word is that's coming out of your mouth? Have you thought about it? Because a snowflake is actually an amazing thing. I'm happy to be one. I would have thought for sure that 
part of the reason he called you that was because you were white. <laughs> but obviously, he had no idea. No. <laughs> yeah. No, then he latched onto my name, and he said, well, you're not an American anyway. <laughs> and, I, and I said, you latched onto my name, but did you look at my picture? I'm pretty white. <laughs> if that's what you're talking about, you know. Because some of these people, they associate being American with being white. Like, how ridiculous is that? How absolutely irrational is that? You could be anywhere in the world. It just happened to be here. Absolutely, absolutely. But this is just to say that, that this type of mindset is lost. But it's not lost within the calling. It hasn't surrendered to the calling it's lost in the ego. Totally lost in the ego that they would look at anyone, no matter what criteria it is that they're looking at, whether it be skin color or the, the first language that they speak or what color they dye their hair or how they dress or what gender they associate with. And they would assume that that's the criteria for being an American. That's, to me, that's sad. To me, that's, that is just so limiting. And to me, that is the fodder that builds fires. Fires of destruction and fires of harm. Yeah. I look in, in, in this room and in our greater community, and, and I see the diversity is what makes us the community. That we each bring to this table something unique and special. And that it is inspiring and in some way, knowing that that diversity exists, knowing that we can embrace our diversity, is in some way what allows us to close our eyes and to surrender to that inner calling, to become lost in that, to let go of our ego, versus looking for the enemy, which is not conducive to closing the eyes, never mind seeking peace or surrendering to it. <clears throat> we had someone in our family who was trained uh, in the military to do some special work for uh, it's the FBI or something, I'm not sure. One of the things that they taught them was that you don't close your eyes for an extended period of time and you never sit with your back to the door. You sit and you pay attention. And every person who walks through the door, you should know exactly what they're wearing, exactly what they look like. You should always be on alert. That's exhausting. Oh. <clears throat> can you imagine? Can you imagine? Can you, and, and now, can you understand why there's so much violence within our military? Not because of war, but because of fear. Not because of war, but because of fear. Because they're lost to their fear, in their fear. They're waiting for the next bomb to drop. They're waiting for the next person to walk through the door who's a threat. They can't take a moment and soften or close the eyes because they're too much on alert, too too afraid. And I, and I have so much respect for our military. I truly do. Because the service that they do to our country is something that most people would not step up to do. But I also see that they, um, many of them lose something. They lose a connection to themselves. Because they're brought in, they're trained by being torn down and rebuilt again according to a particular model. And as a result of that, they lose a bit of a connection to themselves. And it's replaced with a, a hierarchy of philosophy, governmental or political philosophy, which then continues to feed that fear. Did you want to ask something? 
I'm wondering if you get lost in your ego gets lost in that hierarchy. And I was also thinking about the fact that a lot of people join the military because there is no other choice from them mm -hmm. and they're escaping violence or really bad circumstances. So when they're torn down even more, like a Stockholm syndrome thing happens. Absolutely. It's so sad. Yeah, it is. So the contentment or the clarity comes from understanding that these people are making a sacrifice. And whatever role it is that they're playing, it is a role that they are playing both in this world and, and in the spiritual plane. So they, they are where they are, and they are being torn down and built back up because it's where they're meant to be. Because their work of awakening can be done there. It can be done there if they don't get lost because of the fear, because of the external situation that they find themselves in. In every moment, they have the opportunity to close their eyes and to surrender to something greater inside. But that takes, that takes an, a, a unique person to be able to do that in the face of being torn down and built back up by an external factor, like a government, or a colonel, or a general, or you know, a, a, a command, what, whatever they, what do they call, platoon command, yeah. <clears throat> we do it every day. You know, we can look at the military and say, you know, that's a real, uh, that's a real interesting example to use, but what about us every day? We go to work. You know, and the boss wants us to be a certain way and our coworkers want us to be a certain way. We come home, our spouse, our loved one, our children want us to be a certain way. We go out with our friends, they want us to be a certain way. They're constantly tearing us down and building us back up. And in those relationships, are we willing to close the eyes, even symbolically, and surrender to the calling to come closer to who we really are, to come closer to the inner peace? Or are we afraid we'll lose our friends, lose our family, lose our job? I had a student, she, I had a couple of students from Wall Street by now, interestingly. I always like when like these corporate kind of people come for the training, you know, because it's like, wow, that's so amazing. And they come and they have this inspiration to bring it back there with them. They're like, oh man, these people need this. And I'm so inspired by that. I think it's beautiful, you know? And, uh, and so I've, uh, the one person that I'm thinking about, when, when they, they went back to work, they brought the yoga with them. And I said, aren't you worried, you know, that they're going to be like, there's no place for this here. This is like high pressure job. You've got to be on top of this, that, the other thing. It's all finances. It's all this, you know, economic engine that they're playing with. And there's no time to meditate. She was like, I don't care. Then they'll do it in the lunchtime. They'll do it whenever. We'll find a way to do it because they just need to sit and close their eyes for just a moment and remember that this is not the be-all, end-all, that there's something else that lies beyond. From yeah. what I understand, some of the large corporations are actually paying their top uh, money crunchers to actually take power naps, yeah. like 10, 15 minutes, you know, they yeah. pay for it. Yeah. Some, some of those... Big corporations are absolutely doing that. They shouldn't pay for the power nap, though. They should pay to have somebody come in and teach meditation. Yes, yes, yeah. true. Yeah. Um, but then there's this whole thing in, in the yoga and in Buddhism, you know, and in any tradition that has meditation as a component of not harming, of non-greed, non-grasping. And what is the major job there is to grasp at results. So until the powers that be in those corporations can either open up their minds to understand that um, that that doesn't have to be a, uh, um, that doesn't have to be a conflict, uh, they they won't in large part invite the meditators in because they're afraid that their workers will lose their edge. Mm -hmm. mm, yeah. But as Swami Shivananda 
and so many other swamis and 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 you know just blessed people who have seen the bigger picture have said in the past you don't have to fear about not having enough you just need to surrender to it you need to surrender to the fact that the abundance exists and Swami Shivananda specifically said, if you spend, 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 he will send, send, send. <laughs> and I will tell you that it's true. At least from where I sit, it is true. Because there is no other way that this would be here. There's no other way that, that over the past 12 or so years, we would have been able to do the work that we've been doing. Because there were times where anybody else would have closed. If it was a yoga studio, anybody else would have closed. They would have said, this isn't financially viable. It wasn't supposed to be financially viable. It was meant to be a service. And so we invested everything we had into it. Not because we wanted to pay back, but because... We wanted to walk through the world a certain way. We wanted to create our own reality. And so we did. And time after time, you know, people would say, how can you do this? I said, well, because it's the world I want to live in. There's a world you want to live in. There's a world you want to live in. There's a world you want to live in. There's a world I want to live in. This is the world I want to live in. This is the world that I'm choosing. And so, so pretty much everything that we had went to supporting the world that we want to live in. And then, you know, tides changed and Ed was diagnosed with cancer and, and we literally gave away 80% of what we owned. We literally gave almost everything away. But still, the school was there. Still, it made its way. Still, we were able to support it. Still. Because the intention went from just being a nice thought about living a certain kind of lifestyle to taking a life of its own on. And the next thing that you know... We're in the middle of, you know, pretty much health dilemma after health dilemma, you know, and lots of other things happening in life and lots of choices being made. And then all of a sudden, this happens. We had given away everything. You know, we were living, we moved from our home to, to a little one-bedroom apartment in Jackson, New Jersey, where somebody else took care of the maintenance. It was nice, to be honest with you. I didn't have to mow the lawn. I didn't have to change the light bulbs. I could just take care of Ed while he was, you know, recouping. We didn't, we got rid of everything. We got rid of all our credit cards. We got rid of everything. We had maybe 10, 15 boxes of stuff. Maybe. We got rid of all unnecessary furniture. We got rid of all our trinkets. We got rid of it all. All we had left was the yoga school and a little apartment and a dog and a cat. And the universe said, okay, now you're ready. Here. And then somehow this happened. And so it goes from being a nice thought to being a reality You just have to have faith in it. You have to lose the ego to the calling inside. Just put the ego out to to pasture. And allow yourself to have faith in the goodness that your life can manifest. And then manifest it more by being it. Not by going out and looking and demanding, fearing, doubting, challenging, but by being. And then the contentment comes in. 
And the contentment allows you to see more clearly, to accept more fully, to love more unconditionally, and to see that most of what we say are just words. I love in the scriptures it says, I'm paraphrasing a little bit, the one who is fearful will come across fear a lot of the time. People will be afraid of them. Animals will be afraid of them. They'll be uneasy. But the one who relinquishes their fear, people won't be afraid of them. They'll take solace in their company. Even animals will approach them easily because they'll know there's no violence there. And that's always been an inspiration, walking this path. And it makes me think of St. Francis of Assisi and that beautiful picture with all the animals sitting around him, the deer, the rabbit, the dog, the birds. Most people don't know that there's a form of Shiva, Prajapati, where he too is sitting and the animals are gathered around him because he's conquered his fear. And in that state of meditation, (coughs) of walking meditation, of living meditation, of being, he surrendered to the call. He became lost in the calling, not moved further away from it. So any questions or thoughts? (laughs) Yes, ladies first. Um, spend, spend, spend? Yes. Spend, spend, spend. He will send, send, send. Okay. Thank you. And it's all about the natural abundance that exists. It's saying that if we stop for a moment, if we just stop being afraid that we lack, that we don't have enough, then what our hearts and minds can open to and what our eyes can begin to see is that there's abundance everywhere. It's just that our poor choices are limiting it artificially. See, there is enough food for everybody in the world. Absolutely, nobody in this world has to go hungry. But the powers that be don't want it that way because fear is their tool. But you see, we don't have to succumb to that, though, because we have backyards that we can grow gardens in, and we have hands that we can harvest with, and we can have hearts that we give with. Nobody has to go hungry, even if the powers that be are leading through fear. Yes, Cal? Um, All right, I guess it's safe to say that a balanced ego serves some type of purpose. Sure, of course. Okay. So, I don't want to use the word goal, so... You can use goal. All right. (laughs) Um, So the goal is not to totally annihilate the ego, totally, Mm. but have it balanced. But is it possible to have it balanced the other direction where you're... where, I don't know... What is the other direction? What, what? what is the other direction? Where it's, okay, as you said, most people nowadays, it's unbalanced the one direction. Mm. Toward violence. Yeah, like, you know, um, with, with having attachments, fear, greed, you know, things like that. But going the other direction where it, it, it goes beyond being balanced in mm. the other direction. It does. It makes absolute sense. And um, yes, it's it is possible. Um, 
It's absolutely possible. I think that there's some semantics, though, that different teachers would say, different words that they would use for this. But basically, when the ego is out of balance, it exists in a state of grasping. So it's going to grasp at safety, it's going to grasp at money, at fame, at fortune, at love, at sex, at food, whatever. It's going to grasp. So when the ego is out of balance, it wants these things because, because it does. Because it, it thinks it's going to make it better, it thinks it's going to make it feel better, it's going to make it important. Um, it's proof that I can get what I want. Um, that's power. So the ego is very much um, about forcing about forcing, forcing through grasping. Does that make sense? Okay. So now balancing the ego will move us consistently toward a state of not grasping, of understanding that we don't have to be the first one in line. We don't have to be the last one in line. We don't have to be in the line. That's a whole other thought, right? Um, yeah, unless you're hungry. And if you're hungry, then have it. But the sense of smell pulls us there and says, oh, there's roasted apples today. I'm going to have some of those. And then ask yourself, do I need those? Eat them, yes. But, but know whether you're eating them because you need them or because you want them. And that's the key to balancing the ego, knowing what you need versus what you want. Going after what you want will cause violence on some level. But accepting what you need won't. Because when we acknowledge that we have needs, true needs, part of that is also acknowledging that all others do too. And then the grasping will lessen to work toward ensuring that all people receive what they need, even if they don't get what they want. So the ego can continually balance, become balanced by moving in that direction. Some people would say that there comes a point in time for less than 0.0001 of the population of all time, um, where at some point the ego becomes a non-issue. Now, it doesn't necessarily mean it's no longer there. It just means that it's neutral. It's a non-issue. As long as we're in this physical body and our biology is functioning the way it's functioning and the electrical circuits in the brain are functioning the way they're functioning, the ego is always going to exist. But depending on the health of this body, um, the spiritual practices that we have in place, the devotion that we experience, what we call shraddha in uh, Sanskrit, depending on the foundation that we have for our surrender to be more complete, will tell us if the ego will remain a neutral factor or if it will revert back to a more harmful state. And the Buddha said that as long as we're embodied in a physical body, there's always the possibility that we will go back there to the point where the ego is in charge. Now, as we move in that other direction of peace and of love and of harmony, we have to be really mindful because, again, the ego is the great mimicker. So how do we know that we're not just being self-righteous? You know, how do we know that we're not just tooting our own horn? I'm so good and you're not. Look at everything I've done. Look at me. Yay, yay, yay. Me, me, me. How do we know that that's, that that's not the ego play trying to suck you back in in the other direction again? And the number one answer to that I've found is typically humility. Typically humility. And typically, clarity. So to be clear and humble. And to not make oneself appear to be something that you're not. 
The reality is we're all flawed. The reality is we're also all perfect. We're perfect in our imperfections. We're perfectly flawed. We're here to do spiritual work. We're here to stumble and fall, and we're here to pick ourselves back up again. We're here to explore this ego and see which part of this ego drives me to crave acceptance, which part of this ego allows me to be peaceful, which part of this ego causes me to want to do good work. You know, we do good work because of the ego. Absolutely. And that's not a bad thing. Because we have a sense of what is right and what is not right. And that's the ego. But when it becomes fundamental, and I start saying something like, well, you're a Christian, so you're wrong. You're a Jew, so you're wrong. You're a yogi, so you're wrong. You're this, so you're wrong. You're that, so you're wrong. That's fundamentalism. And that's the other direction. That's violence. I think it was really simply said that... um, you can lead a horse... Wait a minute, no, that's not the right one. <laughs> well, actually, it might be. You can lead a horse to water, but you can't make him drink, right? right. No, there was another one I was thinking of. That basically, um, people who follow blindly are not really following. They're just numb. So you can want people to adhere to your particular personal dogma all you want. I'd love if everybody in the world was yogi. I think that'd be amazing. People sitting and meditating all the time, chanting all the names, you know, talking about peace and love. That'd be great. Okay, so let's put together an army of yogis and we'll sweep across the nation and we'll force everybody into alignment. You see? Like making everybody do chiropractic. <laughs> <laughs> Would that make them yogis? No. No. Because, and would it make them good people? No. Now, Swami Swatmarama knew this. He wrote the Hatha Yoga Pradipika. And Patanjali also knew this, but was from a different mindset. Patanjali listed out his yoga path as starting with the yamas and the niyamas. And it begins with non-harming. And it says that you should be non-harming. You should harm nothing out of anger. You should harm nothing out of vengeance. You should not be driven by your emotions to inflict violence on anybody or anything. And as, as a yoga practitioner, that is what you should adhere to. Swami Swatmarama, and I think it was like the 1300s, if I'm not mistaken, when he wrote the Hatha Yoga Pradipika, He doesn't talk about ethics in there. He doesn't talk about ethics. He talks about hatha yoga. And what he said in there was, or I'm pretty sure he's the original author. Um, He said, if you force people to become ethical, if you force them to be nonviolent, if you force them to be non-grasping, if you force them to abide in the yamas and niyamas, they'll go mad because they don't understand. Because they don't know. Because they haven't done their work. Because they haven't done the self-study. They'll go mad. They'll actually go insane. Their neurology will turn on them. And they'll have all kinds of health issues because, because they are not there because that's not where their understanding is, because they can't surrender, because they don't have the skill to or the tools. So he said, so you have to start with physical practices and pranayama practices and rituals, which cultivate an understanding, which allows the person's heart to move toward that place of nonviolence. And you shouldn't judge them along the way. You should see with clarity where they are But you should not condemn or elevate. You should simply witness and realize that 
Today we are all in one place, and tomorrow we will all be in another. And that's the path. So you can't force. You cannot force clarity. You cannot force peace. You cannot force nonviolence. It's a, you know, that's, that's, that in and of itself is violence. Instead, we hold space. And we say, this is the sanctuary where you do your work. Period. Now, this morning in class, we did talk, and I'll just go on for another moment, about good association and bad association, this concept that a lot of the you know, spiritual teachers, the, the great spiritual teachers have talked about. The Buddha talked very clearly about good association and bad association and said, it's not that you see the person who's consuming a lot of alcohol and taking drugs and call them bad. No. They're on a path. And whether you understand it or not, there is something there for them if they're open to it. But you do not keep company with them because otherwise you will become like them. So you honor, you respect, you witness, but you do not keep company. And I believe that if it wasn't the Buddha, then it was somebody in that time frame who also said, the one who keeps company with thieves becomes a thief. The one who keeps company with murderers becomes a murderer. The one who keeps company with liars becomes a liar. The one who keeps company with yogis becomes a yogi. And the one who keeps company with the peacemakers becomes a peacemaker. Association. So the ego will tell you, but they're more fun. So I want to go over there. They're boring. I don't want to go over there. They've got it a little backwards. They're distracted and suffering. And that's something to talk about. They're peaceful. And experiencing some level of freedom, that's what we all say we want. Isn't it? I don't know. Something to think about on a Sunday afternoon. <laughs> Any other thoughts or questions? You set your boundaries, non-violently. Yeah. You just say, this is the way I feel. Right. This is the way that I feel. This is the way that I am compelled. And you can either be aligned with that or not, but I'm going to make my decisions based on my heart. Mm -hmm. And you will make yours based on yours. That's all. And as, and as a partner in that business, you have a say of what happens to whatever portion of the partnership is yours. Mm -hmm. And that's what you work with. I knew somebody one time who used to say to me, why do you give so much at Christmas? You, you, you adopt a family, or five. Yeah, you still love to. Oh. Just sit there and have... This family, that family, this family, that family. Anonymously, you know. I mean, nobody knows who's doing it. And then on top of that, go and put stuff into all the bins for the Christmas kids, you know. And stop at, like, the local church that has the Christmas tree with the little names on it. And you can give there anonymously. And I just, just keep doing it. And they say, why do you, why do, you do that? That's so elaborate. It's, so, it's too much. I said, because... The reality is because someone did it to me once. And that was the promise I made, was that for as long as I could, I would provide that for someone else. And we didn't see eye to eye at first on that. But a few years later, 
like a contagion, that person caught on. And suddenly, they began to find joy in the giving. Not because I said they had to, not because I made it a requirement of a relationship, not because of anything like that, but because they witnessed, they saw, they did whatever they did mentally and emotionally with that information, and eventually, they, they, they recognized. Your partner may or may not recognize. That's not so much what matters. What matters is that you follow your heart. Isn't it okay with that, with that, you know, slogan saying whatever, um, if, if you give, give, give. If you spend, 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 he yeah. will send, send, send. Is, isn't it possible for that to be a huge green light for the ego? Sure. Absolutely. <laughs> Are you kidding me? <laughs> of course it is. So here's the thing. Uh, let's look at Joel. What's his name? Olstein? 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 Okay. Uh, you know the, the one at the, the evangelical? Guy, the guy with all the money. That guy. Spend, spend, spend your money. Give it to me, give it to me, give it to me. Because poor me. I need another private jet. <laughs> I need one that flies east only, and I need one that flies west. And then I need one that flies south only. And then I need one that flies north only. Is that not a little bit odd? I mean, this is something that, that like, this person, that's very much paraphrased, but he actually... He actually, if I'm not mistaken about this, requested additional funds from his followers so that he could get another private jet. Oh my God. Okay, that's pretty blatant. You know that that's the ego. I don't care how much God sent him down here. That is the ego. You do not need a private jet. Go fly coach and feed people, <laughs> okay? God needs him to have a private jet. <laughs> God needs him to have a private jet. God said, he told me, he said, go fly coach and feed people. Or better yet, do a van across the country with food in the back and stop and give it to people. Have face-to-face time with people. You know? So I, it's, it's pretty easy, probably particularly when you're sitting on the outside of it, um, to see when the ego is out of balance. But then also it's not because sometimes we don't recognize it in other people. We think that they're being egotistical, but they're really not. So... So MYOB, that's the second part of it, mind your own business. It doesn't really matter what Joel's doing. He's got his karma, his personal karma, and his collective karma with his population, and that'll sort itself out, and it'll be what it's meant to be. I have my personal karma, you have your personal karma, we have our collective karma. But the day that I ask you for money to buy a private jet, I hope you walk out the door. <laughs> Truly. I just don't think it's going to happen. <laughs> yeah think so either I don't mind if you help us pay the electric bill (laughs) I don't mind that at all you know Um, but yes it can absolutely be so yeah so it's a trick the motivation or the um, what what do you want to call it behind the giving means a lot yeah absolutely yeah absolutely it means everything doesn't it not giving (coughs) spending 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 Spending, it means everything. Yeah. You know, Swami G is so, he's so humble. The last time he was here, not this time, but the last time, he was having some back pain. And I said to him that, you know, someone had offered to give him a massage. And he said, oh, that's elaborate. That's taking a Tylenol is elaborate. Taking a Tylenol adjusts in a non natural way the way the body functions. That's elaborate talked him into getting the massage because he was in pain, you know? But he, but he was like, he goes, do you really think it's okay? And I said, yes, Swamiji, it's a gift. You give, but you also have to receive. There has to be a balance, you know? So, so that's an interesting thing to think about too. Popping Tylenols every two seconds. If you're not in pain, why are you popping Tylenols? And if you are in pain... What can you do for your body healthfully that will bring it to a state of balance without the ego saying, oh, quick fix, blue pill, blue pill, blue pill. Mm. Sometimes the Tylenol is necessary, sometimes it's not. But you're the only one who knows that. 
And that's, the, that's pretty much the key to the conversation today, is that you're the one who knows. You really do know. You just close the eyes and go beyond the chatter, go beyond the physical sensations, and listen. Because the answer is there. Stop denying it. It's there for you. It's there for every one of us. Mm. So let's sit talk, close the eyes, and draw the hands together in front of the heart. And just for a moment, go beyond the mental chatter, go beyond the words, go beyond the emotions, go beyond the physical sensations. Go to the core of your being. Namaste. Thank you all so much for sitting today and for taking part. I hope you enjoy your day. And I hope you have a wonderful brunch and maybe stay for Kirtan or hop into Qigong um, or take a walk in the park or let the rain just wash down on you. Whatever it is, enjoy it. Thank you.